I'm Joan Anderson. I'm a producer at Paradox Interactive, and I'm here to talk about Crusader Kings 2, which is a medieval RPG strategy game. Uh, the game is set on a big map of uh, Europe, uh, North Africa, and the Middle East in the medieval time period from 1066 to 1337. You can start at any given date with any lord or lady or whoever holds land in that time period. I'm going to start as a little Swedish duke, a 10-year-old boy in charge of a county called Östergötland here in central Sweden, far north in Europe and very, very forgotten part of the world. Little Duke Sven, as you see up here, is just a boy. He's a Catholic and lives there. He doesn't know who his mother is, but he knows who his father is. Uh, he's a vassal of the King of Sweden, and in, in this time period, uh, countries were not really centralized and united. They were a kind of like a vassalage system where you had kings, beneath them dukes, then counts, then barons, bishops, and majors that handled these different uh, parts of the realms. So if you're looking at the map, uh, we have uh, all these countries with names on the map and uh, seeing where the countries are, borders in various colors. The Swedish borders are blue and yellow, and other countries have their own colors on their borders. But we're part of here in Östergötland, a small little state. As I was talking, we knew what the father was. Sven is a Catholic little boy, but his father is not a Catholic. He's a Norse pagan. So in this time period, uh, the, the Christian faith were still spreading around in Europe and, part, and the northern part of uh, uh, Norway and Sweden at the start of the game are still pagan. If I'm going here to the religious map mode we can see that uh, most of Europe is uh, Christian and there's Muslims in the south, uh, you have the Orthodox Christians in the east but most of the north is still pagan backwater. So. Uh, one thing with Crusader Kings is that bes besides just conquering parts from your, for your, for yourself and conquering the map, it's a role-playing game. In role-playing, it's a character-driven in that what matters to your characters is the relations with other characters, your attributes, what you do, your personal ambitions. Um, since time passes on, you need to marry, you need to have children, you need to marry into other countries and strengthen your own dynasty. We can see that the Avsverke dynasty, it's not very, very big. It's basically two people in this house, Sven and his father, Kål. Not much known about them. If we're going to someone more famous, like William the Conqueror, also known as William the Bastard, they have a pretty big dynasty tree here, the, the, the Normandies. And as you play through the ages, you'll get more and more people going in here, you can expand and see who his children are and who's and who everyone that's had a title in the game before. Um, if we go back to Sven here, I'm going to tell you something interesting. I said that his father belonged to another religion. That could be a little pro big problem because his father has no title. He belongs to the old religion and he's going to have the ambitions to strengthen that religion and that will be in a direct conflict with uh, Sven, who's a, who's a nice little Catholic boy that wants to be uh, good relations with the Christian kings of Europe. So uh, what shall we do then with him? We'll go to his father and we can do multiple things. We can try to put our father in prison. Uh, we can try to ask him to convert to the Catholic faith or we can have him assassinated. Of course, assassinating your own father is kind of uh, not really a good uh, career uh, highlight, and people will view you slightly different. But the things you do for power, this game is uh, it's all about the intricacies and the game, I was actually going to say Game of Thrones, but that's a good description. That's what I was thinking of, actually. Yeah? Very, very storyboard-oriented. <laughs> yeah. Are there any cinematics? Uh, no cinematics. It's, it's pure gameplay, um, things that happen and things you do to, uh, to the game. So, but there's events that happen to your character that you don't have 100% control over what happens. And especially when you're playing as a child, uh, during the first years, those are very formative. So that you will be able to gain traits. If I'm going back to 
Duke Sven here, we'll see that one of his little tr uh, icons there indicates that he's a just character. So a person that's just is viewed favorably by most people. If we're looking at our court, some people that likes us because uh, they are, uh, because we are just, they, their opinions is increased. But when you grow up as a child, as time goes on, you'll be, the time is ticking up here, uh, you'll be able to gain uh, certain, ev certain events that appears that will give you uh, more traits and improve your characters. While the time ticks forward, I'm going to raise our armies, and you'll see, okay, here we got one. I'm pausing the game, and we'll see what we can do. I always do my homework and my course before I go play. Oh, I'm special. It means that Sven has gained the trait of diligent. When he clicks on this, when we click on this one, we'll inform the guardian. Every child has a guardian, which could be the parent or someone else that you assign to them that will be handling their education. We'll see what happens to them now. And the guardian doesn't really care. It doesn't encourage us. We're still diligent, but we're going to have some bad relations with our uh, guardians in the future. I raised an army here, and armies in uh, Crusader Kings have the crest of the local lord, or, or which is ours, on their tabards. You can, when you zoom out, you see small representations of the shields as well. So when you see people fighting, you'll see all these tabards and banners uh, of your colors going around. You can march your troops whenever you, wherever you want them in Europe. But uh, when to fight a war, you need to have a legitimate cause of, to fight the war. Uh, there's plenty of other things that can affect your country, like different laws uh, that you can introduce. For example, uh, here you have an agnatic gavel kind that the oldest children gets the best title and then the titles are spread. Uh, you can have other laws that allow the senior senior uh, member of the dynasty to inherit everything, or you can introduce that the women can inherit, which was not that common in this area. We also have laws for uh, how the bailiff should be uh, allowed, and all of these different laws that affect your realm that you can introduce or revoke. There's also technology, military, intrigue, where people are, have ambitions and try to plot and have all these nice little backstabbing things that will appear during the game. You have diplomacy with every character you can have diplomatic actions with. There's over 9,000 historical characters at the start of the game. <coughs> and there's more characters that bo be born over time. So it's a very, very complex living world. Is it based on any historical significance? With yes, at the start of every time, this complete historical setup of the world. So when we're starting here in uh, 1066, uh, we have uh, William the Conqueror and uh, let's see, where's Duke William? He's dead now, uh, two years into the game, but he was the big uh, thing. Also, for people that want to learn history, we try to include Wikipedia links wherever possible, so that when you click on something, you open up a browser of. Uh, so you can see, see, read the Wikipedia article of uh, that historical character, which is a good learning tool for people. Very good. So that's my quick little brief of Crusader Kings 2, which is a game that should be out in January. If all things go well, it will be out in January on Inbox and digital download for PC and Mac.